This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today, we've got journalist Christopher Miller back on the show to talk about the recent clashes in the Sea of Azov in Ukraine. On Sunday, Russia attacked Ukraine for the first time in the recent war, officially. They shelled Ukraine boats, they've taken prisoners of war, they've taken the sailors and put them on trial in Crimea. And right now, things are escalating quite fast. The whole of Europe, NATO, everybody's watching. So we got Christopher on to kind of give us a special report on what's going on there right now in the Sea of Azov. If you want to keep Popular Front moving forward, consider joining us at patreon.com slash popular front. The Popular Front trench mugs are now on sale in the shop. That is popularfront.bigcartel.com. What happened uh, in, the, in the Sea of Azov? We know there's been these clashes with Russia. They shelled a Ukraine boat and it's all kind of gone a bit mad. Yeah, um, I, it has gone a bit mad. Uh, but, you know, as we, as we spoke before, this has been building and building and building now for months, right? It was, it was actually back in May when tensions, uh, you know, first kind of um, uh, flared when, when Russia finished the construction of this bridge over the Kerch Strait. And then over the, the, the following months, there were the uh, detentions by, by, by Russian FSB boats of more than 150 merchant ships. And then at the same time, Ukraine had also detained some Russian ships. And then also both sides were moving uh, naval vessels into the Sea of Azov. The Russians um, moving uh, more, than, more than 56 of them, uh, actually, including part of its Black Sea fleet and Caspian flotilla. So, you know, they were, they were both militarizing this very small shared sea. Um, and, you know, what happened on Sunday was just all of this tension finally boiling over. And as Ukraine uh, was moving two, two gunships and a tugboat from the Black Sea port of Odessa to the Mariupol port in the Sea of Azov, um, it was intercepted by several Russian Navy ships, Coast Guard boats, and uh, now, according to the uh, Ukrainian Security Service, also a fighter jet, at least one fighter jet and an attack helicopter. And the confrontation happened, depending on who you believe, either in Russian-controlled waters or in uh, international waters um, near, near the shores of uh, Russia-occupied Crimea. And just before the Ukrainian ships were able to enter the Kerch Strait, which is the, the, the opening and the only entrance, actually, to this Sea of Azov. Now, if you want to get into the specifics of what exactly occurred in this skirmish, um, you know, what we know is these, these uh, three Ukrainian vessels were first um, confronted by the Russians, uh, forced to turn around, they were chased. And then the tugboat was rammed by a Russian ship. And then the uh, two uh, Ukrainian naval gunships were fired on by um, uh, uh, what we've been told is uh, at least one Russian um, uh, gunship. And then today the Security Service of Ukraine actually said, uh, I believe for the first time, that uh, one, one Russian jet fighter and an attack helicopter fired on and struck the hulls of the uh, two Ukrainian gunships. So after that all happened, the Russians detained the three Ukrainian vessels, dragged them to uh, a port uh, in Crimea, and detained 24 Ukrainian servicemen. And those 24 servicemen have now appeared in a courtroom in Crimea, and they have been, uh, I, I believe, um, uh, given uh, 60 days, 60 days pre-trial detention. Three of them uh, also were injured in the attack, and we, we don't know what uh, their current state of health is. We know that one was was critically wounded, but uh, there haven't been any reports of of uh, of any um, any deaths at the moment. So that's 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 what happened. And I know it's a lot to. To, to take in but um you know it's it's a bit of a complex situation absolutely so it's, it seems like a really big escalation why do you think this has happened now i know you said that it's been building for months but why now you know it seems very it seems kind of calculated to me but you know i i don't know the ins and outs of it 
Yeah, you know, I, I think there are there are several there are several reasons. I mean, first, one of the interesting things is you know this this Sea of Azov is a is a jointly controlled and shared sea under uh, what has become a, a controversial. 2003 agreement signed by by the Russians and, and the Ukrainians and it's it's you know in a, a very small sea and it's actually the world's shallowest but you know it's it's now come uh, to be you know um, of, of, of great kind of global um, geopolitical importance right and I think you know several, there are several reasons why this this happened now first like I said all these tensions have really just been um, growing and growing and growing and with that kind of military presence and this on, only this one strait available for ships to pass through and merchant vessels to pass through you know we it, it just has seemed like you know some kind of uh, clash was bound to happen but also you know there is uh, uh, the G20 summit um, that is happening this weekend and you know Russia could be looking to sort of up the ante, uh, test test what kind of international response there might be, uh, you know, to uh, to to it kind of um, again turning up the the heat on Ukraine four months ahead of Ukraine's presidential election. There's also some other things that you have to take into account. Um, Putin's popularity has fallen a little bit. Um, domestically and you know we, we we know that from his 2004 annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass that when he asserts uh, Russia's military might abroad his popularity at home rises a little bit you know as Russians kind of forget about domestic problems um, uh, you know they they, they, they favor Putin um, and and like him just a little bit more when he's uh, toiling in other people's affairs. There's also, of course, from the Ukrainian side, like I said, an election coming up, and you know, I, I, it's I, I don't think it's right to say, uh, without any evidence, we don't have any, um, that the Ukrainians were looking to provoke something, even though that's that's what Russia has said. But you know, once this attack did occur, uh, what we saw the following day was Poroshenko move to impose martial law in Ukraine, and more than. For, for more than four and a half years of war here, there hasn't been any uh, introduction or declaration of martial law, though there was some talk of it in 2014, 2015, and there certainly were plenty of people in the security services and National Security and Defense Council who, uh, you know, would have liked to have seen that because it would allow them to assert more power and restrict things like movement and and um, tighten uh, uh, movement uh, across the borders, uh, and then and, and then also um, uh, give them more more power in what are the conflict areas in eastern Ukraine, you know. But th there's you know there there's there's you know some reason to think that Poroshenko may have been using um, uh, this situation um, you know to his to his political advantage. But I think we should be careful in saying you know just how much. Uh, of it is is political maneuvering and his popularity is quite bad right now isn't it exactly you know it, his popularity has has been low for a while uh, recently it's 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 plummeted you know pretty pretty far from where it was when he was elected in 2014 but the one area where he is um, uh, relatively popular and see, and he's seen more broadly as doing a good job is reforming the military. Some people, view, oh, many many Ukrainians view him as a strong commander in chief. You know, he likes to put on uh, military fatigues and he visits the troops often in the in the in the front lines. Uh, just yesterday, he did so at a. Um, uh, military installation in Chernigiv region, just which is just a couple of hours north of the capital Kiev, and it's one of the ten regions that was put under uh, martial law as of yesterday morning. And you know, so that that could uh, that that does that does kind of like fuel fuel the the idea that you know he's he's using this for a, a little bit for political gain, right? He sees that this sort of thing does benefit him. You know, he's been he's been criticized for not. Not carrying out all of the reforms that Euromaidan activists uh, who overthrew his predecessor uh, would like to have been implemented, and the military is one one area where he does have uh, support. So, sort of playing that up in the run up to the election is is you know no doubt a a, uh, a political 
a political move for him. Mm. Something I wanted to ask about that I saw on the day that happened, and I haven't really seen anything else about it. There was this thing where just as these clashes broke out in the Sea of Azov, all of a sudden there were all these protesters on the Polish border, I believe it was, and the Slovakia border to Ukraine. And, you know, I know the Ukraine said it. I don't know what happened, but they said there were, you know, civilian cars with foreign plates. And it just seemed very weird. They started burning tires and then I didn't see anything else about it. Do you know what happened there? Yeah, actually, it doesn't have much to do with what happened in the Sea of Azov or uh, with the Russia conflict. But it, just, to, just to answer your question so your, your listeners know what was happening, it, it, has, it has to do with new registration laws regarding uh, foreign, foreign vehicles. And so I think within the, within the next few months, those vehicles that remain here in Ukraine permanently are going to have to change their foreign, driver, or their, their foreign license plates to uh, Ukrainian license plates. I, I don't know much more in the way of details on that, but that's that's what it what, what it was about. And and it, it, those weren't the first protests. There had been some road blockades in other in other areas of Ukraine as well, where drivers and and I think truckers were were protesting these new um, registration rules. Uh, this is just coincidence, perhaps. Yeah, you know, there's there's a there's a lot that 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 happens here on a on a daily and weekly basis, and Ukraine has a very uh, healthy. Um, protest uh, environment here. People are, are very, you know, actually, actually, to Ukrainians' credit, they're they're very, um, c you know, civic-minded people, and uh, you know, I, I think I think there's there's quite a bit from the international community uh, to learn from from Ukrainians, you know, and it, it, they're, they're people who have had three revolutions in thirty years and know know how uh, or know what it what what people power really is and and, and what it can uh, achieve actually. No, I agree. There are uh, there really are people that are just uh, they're just not having it. <laughs> you know, if like if you try and mess around about what's going on, I like that they're just they're just not having it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. How serious do you think this is? Because I know you've been uh, in the last couple of days been very busy, and today as well, going to the regions right where the um, martial law will take place or as as of yesterday is taking place now what's going on there what's the situation well i mean there, there are huge geopolitical implications for the for the conflict after this clash right so we we do really need to keep a very close eye on what happens after this weekend uh when 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 trump will meet putin for example uh, at the g20 and and you know just keep a keep a close eye on on the fallout and, and that'll give us a better idea of whether or not this is going to escalate and and uh if it's going to to be something that requires even more international attention um and you know and the ukrainians certainly do hope that the international community keeps a close eye on it and and they they would like to see stronger sanctions against russia and and more military uh, assistance as well as far as martial law is concerned i was in i was in kharkiv uh, which is uh, a region kind of um, east east of here, and it borders Russia, uh, uh, Russia Russia's borders to the north of it. Uh, it's about 420 kilometers north of the Sea of Azov. So that should give you an idea of where it is. Again, it's one of these 10 regions under martial law. And, you know, there, weren't, there wasn't anything, um, you know, really kind of visible um uh, there, no no visible difference um from the last couple of times that i've been there over the last you know several months um but you know talking to people you get a sense of 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 many uh many people you know being being uh, concerned um uh or or just kind of shrugging it off you know uh some some people worried that this could lead to a conflict uh like what is happening in Donetsk and Lugansk right now, you know the two war-torn areas that uh, are, have been have been kind of divided and are under the control of Russia-backed separatists. Um, but you know, at the same time, the people in Kharkiv have lived, you know, uh, close to those close to those areas now for four and a half years. There was a, an attempt by Russia-backed separatists to seize government buildings and take control of Kharkiv in 2014, but the effort was repelled. And there's there's a, a big you know pro-Ukrainian sentiment and, and and a lot of pro-Ukrainian support in Kharkiv. So people feel relatively comfor comfortable with that and, and don't feel that you know they're they're going to uh, come under attack. Uh, and if they do, you know, they feel relatively, relatively safe and, and secure there. Um, the Ukrainian military has a pretty big presence there. Um, there, there is. Well, while it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not really anything that's going to stop a, a full-on Russian advance uh, if Russia really wants to. There is a small border fence with anti-tank trenches there as a sort of first line of defense. Um, I did meet actually with the far-right Azov uh, uh, group. 
uh, which I, I believe we, we've maybe discussed before in previous uh, podcasts. And actually, one, one interesting thing that was happening in response to martial law is they're carrying out um, tr uh, weapons trainings. So they put out a call when martial law was being debated in Parliament, before it was approved, uh, and said, look, you know, um, martial law is coming, be prepared, here are our phone numbers to all our regional offices. And I guess on Tuesday, uh, 50 men showed up and uh, went through uh, several hours long uh, weapons training that included, you know, uh, kind of uh, breaking down and, and, and putting back together um, Kalashnikov rifles, among, among other things. And so there are some people who really are uh, preparing for, for what could, what, you know, what, what, they, what they fear would be, would be a bigger war. And uh, specifically, they want to put together the, what they call territorial battalions. Basically, like people who, who would be able to respond faster than the organized official military. So I thought that was interesting. You know, other, other things that I did see were um, uh, some checks of bomb shelters and school buildings, gymnasiums, and just uh, the, the city just, you know, taking precaution and seeing what kinds of areas would be, would be good to hold people in if uh, a full-scale war did break out. But there really wasn't any sense that that would happen there. Uh, I didn't get the sense that people were were greatly concerned about it happening there. They were watching closely what was happening in the south, but they didn't, you know, they, they felt they felt quite a ways quite a ways away from that and pretty secure. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that Azov thing because I was just looking at their uh, their Instagram of their you know their street militia, the the National Corps, whatever they have in Kiev and various other areas. And all of a sudden, all of the pictures were like you just said, they were arms training and you know still wearing the the National Corps street militia jackets and, and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not so surprised by that. You know, these are these are guys that were doing that already before. This is this is uh, just an excuse for them to continue to promote this 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 sort of thing and and try to to get a few a few more people who might not have uh, answered the call before to come in. You know, there's some rumors as well. I, and again, they are just rumors just through various people I was talking to who were saying that some armored vehicles have been given back to various militias uh, on the front line in the Donbass, like right sector and other places. I don't know if you've heard anything about that, or if you know if it's true or not. I mean, I, I haven't been able to confirm any of that. I've seen some of those rumors as well. And, you know, there, there's some talk uh, about about those those sorts of things happening, but you know I haven't been able to corroborate it independently. Sure. And what what does this mean for the Donbass? Do you think if things do really kick off? Because I, I saw that you know there was some reports the other day that in Mariupol that things had been kicking off a little bit more. Um, and also, isn't is is it is this correct that this is the first time that Russia has actually directly kind of attacked Ukraine in this war? Because as we know, they're all over the Donbass, but there were ways, you know, it's not us. Um, is this the first time they've done that officially? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer that question first. Uh, yes, it, 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 it seems like, you know, this has been um, the first time that Russia has overtly attacked Ukraine. You know, in 2014, Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula with uh, quote unquote, little green men, right? These are Russian special forces that were donning, um, uh, you know, unmarked uniforms and wearing wearing balaclavas, and they, they, you know, it was pretty apparent that they came from the Russian Black Sea uh, fleet base there. Um, but you know, they they were unmarked, and Russia denied that they were Russian soldiers. Only only you know, uh, a long time after the annexation did did Putin uh, finally admit that these were Russian soldiers. And then in Donbas, uh, you know we've seen um, you know scrappy local separatists kind of uh, fronting for um, the Ukrainian regular soldiers behind them, who we know are there. There's there's plenty of evidence to to show that these uh, regular Russian soldiers are there, but Russia has denied official involvement in Donbass. But this skirmish in uh, the Black Sea uh, marks the first time that Russia overtly attacked Ukraine and you know admitted to openly, uh, re even released I, I you know released photographs of of, uh, of the clash and everything. So yeah, it's you know this is this is uh, unprecedented in the last four and a half years. And then about Donbass. Now, I, I spoke to some people on the phone uh, who I know uh, in the Ukrainian armed forces, um, and uh, some of some uh, one one guy in Shirokina, a couple of others in Avdeevka, and um, uh, near the uh, Svetlodarsk bulge. Um, and at least in Shirokina, I was told that um, you know the clashes had 
uh, escalated a little bit. Um, there, there wasn't uh, the use of heavy artillery, but they were they were digging some new trenches. Uh, there was an influx of, of of soldiers there, just in case things did kick off a little bit more. In the other areas, in uh, around Svetlodarsk and Avdiivka, they said it was more or less about the same. They noticed uh, heavier gunfire and and just kind of a longer sustained, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, small arms dueling, but but nothing major. And if you look at the numbers. Uh, that the OSCE special monitoring mission keep, you know, they're 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 right around what they've what they've been. So we haven't seen a, a, a real escalation on the ground, but um, you know, it, there there's certainly a fear that that could happen if things uh, continue to escalate and the rhetoric continues to escalate between Ukraine and Russia. And you know, if if today was any indication. Um, you know, I, I think things are, are, are not quieting down quite yet. Actually, just before we started speaking, uh, Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko announced new restrictions on travel to Crimea, for instance. Um, he said no, no one other than Ukrainian citizens would be allowed to travel to the peninsula. That in, and that includes not only foreigners like you and I, but Russians and, and Russians that live in Ukraine, and there are there are many of them. And he also announced restrictions on Russian citizens who who live here. That's a very yes. dangerous game to play, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, he's 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 saying that Russians who live here will not be able to make uh, banking withdrawals or or uh, currency transactions. And so, you know, this is stuff that really affects. Uh, people's livelihood and and uh, yeah just like you said i think this is this is a pretty dangerous game to play mm. and if it does escalate if this does turn ugly or uglier than it has you know i don't know maybe they don't release the the pow's they have now or whatever that is another attack what do you think the international community will do because i know today we heard merkel basically say germany's not getting involved uh, that's the way i read it what do you think is going to happen from i don't know nato america everyone else yeah well if you look if you look at if you look at the reactions i don't think Ukraine should expect uh, nearly as much support as they're hoping for. You know, um, beyond beyond you know statements of condemnation, um, it doesn't it doesn't look like they're going to get get much deep concern. Get, yeah, you know the usual. Uh, you know, deep concern, strongly condemn uh, those sorts of things. Uh, the U.S. was probably the slowest in in condemning the attack, and President Trump himself didn't say anything about it until he was. He was uh, confronted by a reporter on the South Lawn on um, sometime well, I forget now if it was late Monday or or, or, or Tuesday, uh, but it you know it, it took more than more than 24 hours I think for the for for an official U.S. statement, um, and even then you know it was it was more along the lines of of uh, what they've said um, uh, previously you know again you know strong condemnation and I know that we. Um, uh, my, well, my colleague of mine for Radio Free Europe, who's based in Brussels, was saying that uh, in his talks with EU uh, ambassadors and and other EU officials there, that it didn't appear as though uh, there would be uh, any more or at least um, harsher sanctions coming down the pike anytime soon. You know that those were being discussed, but there wasn't any indication yet that um, it was it was a done deal. So you know, um, it's 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 hard to say exactly what kind of uh, uh, support they're going to get beyond beyond the usual. Um, you know, but they're uh, but 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 Ukraine is certainly hoping for more military assistance, especially from the U.S. Uh, and and uh, harsher sanctions if they can get them. And I know that they're lobbying for them uh, very hard. But uh, you know, I think maybe maybe we'll see if something comes out of this G20 summit this weekend um, and how the uh, uh, the expected Trump Putin meeting goes. And you know, maybe maybe Trump's words there will be an indication. Yeah, let, let's hope it all simmers down. Where can people follow your work on this? Because I know like a lot of people that listen to Popular Front have been saying, how can we get more? You know, we want to know what's going on. Yeah, you can follow my reporting on uh, Radio Free Europe's website, rfrl.org, or on Twitter at Christopher JM. Um, uh, from time to time, I freelance for others, and, and I talk to you, and I think that's a good place to start. Thanks very much. I really appreciate that, mate. Sure. Thank you. That was Christopher Miller talking about the recent clashes in the Sea of Azov in Ukraine. It's the first time Russia has officially attacked Ukraine in the recent war and it's escalating quite fast. If you want to keep Popular Front moving forward, 
please do consider pledging at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash popular front. You'll get a few bonus episodes every month, narrated articles, all sorts of stuff like that. This episode was sponsored by the defensepost.com, defense with an S, global defense news, analysis, and opinion. Check them out. And we've got another sponsor now as well. That is Atlas News on Instagram. So Instagram.com slash Atlas.news. If you like Popular Front, you'll like that feed. Have a look. And if anyone wants to sponsor an episode or sponsor the podcast or whatever, get in touch with me at Jake at Hanrahan.tv. But don't come with any fucking mattress deals or anything like that. We're not interested in that. It's got to be relevant to Popular Front. And it's also got to be completely not attached to any lizard men or scumbags, basically. Um, we're not doing that at Popular Front. Independent conflict journalism. We're not having no agenda. We're not having no idiots uh, coming in and messing things up for money. Definitely not. Subscribe to us and hit the bell on YouTube. That is youtube.com slash popular front. Keep up to date on Twitter. Follow me at Jake underscore Hanrahan, H-A-N-R-A-H-A-N. Or the Popular Front account is at Popular Front CO. On Instagram, we've got a lot of stuff on there. Now go to instagram.com slash popular dot front. And to see all the episodes in the right order, what have you, go to popularfront.co. We've got some Popular Front merch in the shop still. There are some mugs left and some patches left. They're nearly all gone, but if you want them, go to popularfront.bigcartel.com. Music in this episode, the intro was by Home and the outro was by Son of Old. Soundcloud.com slash son dash of dash old. للجبهة شعبية اسمع للجبهة شعبية